And this is simple. It's because during the Vietnam War, uh, the POWs were not being properly acknowledged in the families of the POWs, the Strattons, the Stockdales. They made waves. Their wives threatened Richard Nixon, and they got recognition for their cause. The movement that grew out of it, the POW MIA movement, centered on Vietnam and Vietnam combatants. And the reaction from the US government was from the Department of Defense. They naturally drew from their lists. Since then, that has expanded because with DNA analysis, it's now possible to look for the missing from World War II. Uh, the Pacific was a site of great uh, in terms of scope air battles. A lot of Americans were never recovered. And uh, a group uh, started out called Bent Prop, and now they've moved on. They've, they've formulated a, a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Uh, they're called Project Recover, and they make it their business to go out and look for the wrecked aircraft of downed airmen who wore American uniforms. As you know, this is a tripping point for us. So in the name of trying to, to raise awareness, um, I started from the point of my story with wanting to know more about Alfred Parkin <clears throat> and realizing that not only was he not recognized, but the crew is not recognized, and largely they were forgotten within days of their death. Um, so, why do I care? Why a picture of me? Well, um, you, you know you're in the second half of a date with a fighter pilot when he says, enough about airplanes, let's talk about me. <laughs> so, I have to talk about me for a minute. Uh, I, I was uh, flying as a Marine over Afghanistan in 2002. I knew very peripherally my dad's references to Al Park and, and I ignored them because dad started out when we watched those old World War II movies saying, oh yeah, my cousin Al flew bombers. And we say, well, yeah. Well, yeah, he flew Lancasters though. And we go, dad, Lancaster was a British bomber. You don't know what you're talking about. And he'd say, yeah, but he was American. He grew up in New Jersey with us, down the street. Sure he did. Yeah, he was in the Canadian Air Force. And right then we just went, click, okay, dad. <laughs> Shut up, old man, right? I didn't listen to him. And and so six years after he was gone, and I realized there was probably something to it, and I heard something about Canadians flying in the RAF and Americans. I found myself flying over Afghanistan on a quiet, dark night, nothing going on. My, uh, my Afghanistan deployment was probably the most boring flying I've ever done uh, because it just was not... We were there standing watch, except for two times. I never I never expended any, any ordinance. But the terrain was exceptionally high. And the Tian Shan Mountains rose up to the 20, 20 something thousand uh, elevation above sea level. Uh, they're among the, the highest, uh, the, uh, the Himalayas go through there and become the Tian Shans. And the low mountain passes in between were the spots we picked if we had to eject where we were going to try to go. Now, as I've told some of you, our ejection seats are built for a flat earth and they function really well. They have a sophisticated computer. You punch out, little gadgets come out, and they measure your speed, your altitude, and the computer says, now's the time to open the drogue chute, now's the time to open the chute. Problem is, I said flat earth. They weren't built for 22,000 foot mountains. So we had to execute a procedure called beating the seat. If we were going to eject, we were supposed to not lose consciousness, we were supposed to pull a handle, jump away from our seat, and that would manually make the, the uh, chute open. And we would live, big win but then we would come down on one of the darkest parts of the planet, darker than North Korea, in a high mountain pass. And in that one boring night when I allowed my box of emotions to open and never be heard from again. And it was just an incredibly lonely uh, feeling. Somehow, not long after I was on that flight, I realized that's what happened to Alfred that's what happened to his crew. Out near dusk, as it turned out, in the fading light, not seen by anybody and gone, and not remembered. That's an injustice. And that's why I started down this road. So the main brief goes in three portions. I talk first about the Americans, and for the, for the Brits in the room, I want you to hear it once because I think you're gonna like the Americans more as a result. I mean, <laughs> we love you. After, after McDonald's, <laughs> after McDonald's and Elf on the Shelf, we have some work to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about how the Americans came into the crew, 
some of their uh, exploits flying, and then a little bit about their, their recognition, although I can skip over some of that. Um, so I, I normally go to pains to introduce the crew. The one thing I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna introduce you to your own family members. I wanna describe something about Alfred Parkin that to me is really important. And that's that Al's family had escaped the slums of London two generations earlier in 1890. They'd been there for a hundred years. They'd been living in poverty, desperation. Uh, they were carpenters, but they turned to crime to feed themselves. And, uh, and they had several records. They were more documented in the Old Bailey Court than they were in churches. That should tell you something about their desperation and their level of success. Uh, so in 1890, the family goes to, to New York, goes to New Jersey, uh, Al's grandfather starts a sawmill, becomes the county tax collector, enlists in the New Jersey National Guard, uh, then the state militia for the Spanish-American War. And although he doesn't go to combat, he does uh, deploy as far as Virginia with them. So they've made it. They, they, they were being chased by the police in London, and they've come to New Jersey, and now they are upstanding civic leaders. So the family's arc is up. They're living the American dream, literally. Um, it doesn't survive the depression. Uh, although Al gets off to a good start, before his senior year of high school starts, he gets hired by the United States Steamship Line. Uh, it's a line run by the US government and they operate a combination of troop ships and captured German war prizes. And he sails to Europe on one of each, one former troop ship uh, and one former German war prize. It used to be called the Vaterland. Uh, and it was built uh, by Blom and Boss in, uh, I believe it was Hamburg. Right? I've got my, my Baltic German cities correct. Um, so he's, before his senior year starts, he's traveling the world. And you know what a life of possibilities. Uh, so the family's arc wasn't without tragedy. During his senior year of high school, he loses his 11-year-old brother in a, in a sort of inadequately described illness. It starts out as a football injury. He stays in the hospital for a month, and he does not survive. He dies. Two years later, Al's father dies. A year after that, the steamship line stops operations because there aren't enough passengers on steamships. And the family's businesses are starting to fold. They started out with a sawmill, and then they went to a carpentry business, a home building business, a furniture business, a, uh, a door and window business, and one by one, those businesses all failed in the 1930s. Um, so as quick as the family came up, the depression and other circumstances, family health, other tragedies, push that arc back downwards. And four years later, Al, who'd started out, look at this is a high school graduation <laughs> photo. This is a family that's proud of having made it, right? He's working here in a factory in the Bronx, north of Manhattan, making, it's called the Electro Plate Engraving Company. And they, if you know those nostalgic steel signs that are enameled, he worked there, but he wasn't a machinist there. He was what they called a maintenance man, which means he did the dirty work. So all, all that hope and all that promise has just come to a skidding halt. Family tragedy, he's living at home, he's helping his family, but his bills from a couple of years prior to a, an aviation ground school are still unpaid, and he only has eight hours of flight time. He tries to enlist in the Army <laughs> Air Corps in 1940 and is turned back. He's too old, no college degree. He's there, this is where he's gonna live. But one of the days, he probably went to Hoboken uh, Airport. He sees a sign much like this. Um, in the summer of 1940, these signs appeared throughout municipal airports and air terminals, but not published in newspapers. Uh, a man named Clayton Knight formed some sort of a committee and wanted to encourage people to, to join the Royal Air Force in the fight somehow or other. But the committee was without explanation outside of the fact that they based themselves at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Manhattan. <laughs> now I'm certain Alfred Parkin did not go there on his way home from work in his dirty clothes. This is the kind of hotel you dress up to go to and he went there. Um, and he was accepted into the Canadian Air Force and you can see him as a, as a new guy standing some guard duty in the, in the brisk Canadian winter. He gets his wings in November 
1941, and by December, he is on his way uh, to England. I am not meaning any offense. I'm going to skip some of the, the other families because, like I said, you know who they are. Uh, I typically go through and mention that uh, um, that James Grishard is a minister's son who rebels and goes in at a young age, that, uh, um, that Jean Chaunier, sorry, uh, that Jean is an orphan in his teenage years and his sister signs his papers so that on his 18th birthday, he can cross the border and go to Canada and go to war. My point is these people didn't just join. They went through struggles to get there. They took risks to get there. At the time they joined, it was illegal to take an oath to a foreign power that was written into the Neutrality Act in 1937 by Congress. So each of these men were breaking US law and risking being unable to return to the US just to fight, but they did it. That doesn't make them any better than anybody else in this flight, uh, in this crew. It just, to me, it's a very significant beginning to the coming together of people who matter to all of us. A little bit more about these signs. Um, the Clayton Knight Committee was put together by an American civilian who'd flown British fighters during World War I as an American Army officer, strange relationship. Um, Clayton Knight's family had come from Canada and he was approached by the head of Canadian uh, Air Force recruiting, a man named Billy Bishop, to help out in getting some Americans to come across the border quietly because America was still in a very anti-war position. So together with a World War I Canadian fighter pilot who had made some oil money, uh, Knight sets up in the Waldorf Astoria and several other hotels in major cities across the US and then invites people to sign up, but not by going to the newspaper, but just by hanging these little signs uh, at airports. Knight was an illustrator before the war and an illustrator after the war. And uh, so that's, that's him doing a portrait of one of the aviators that, uh, that he recruited. That's Billy Bishop, World War I uh, fighter ace, Canada's greatest fighter uh, pilot at the time, and, uh, and kind of a poster child. So this is one of the notes that one of the applicants left at the Waldorf Astoria because he couldn't just walk in. You had to go up, you had to leave a note, you had to go away, you had to be invited back. All very plausible deniability. I imagine that Alfred left a note like this and possibly the other two. By hook or by crook, they got there. And, and by hook or by crook, the other members of the crew got there. They left police departments, they left their schools, they did whatever they had to do and they got into the Royal Air Force all volunteered. Not one person was conscripted, drafted, what have you. And, and I would say the counterpoint that the, the Brits who came under this crew had that the Americans didn't is anger and suffering because they watched their friends get bombed. They watched their friends go off and not come back. And there's this predominant theme that you read about when you hear about young aviators in Britain is that they were tired of seeing it happen to their loved ones, that they wanted to get back at the Germans. Maybe not revenge, but they, they felt helpless and they didn't want to feel helpless anymore. There's a phrase I heard that I'm fond of. Uh, I heard someone say, that guy took that car and drove it like it was stolen. And to me, that means really just taking that car to the limit of its capabilities and, and being very competitive. And it's what came to mind when I learned about the missions they flew in the Lancaster. You saw how big the Lancaster uh, is today. It has 102 foot wingspans. That means from the center of the aircraft to one wingtip is 51 feet. And I'm gonna tell you about a couple of occasions when they flew them 50 feet high. So if you do the math, if they rolled into a 90 degree angle of bank, they would be cutting their wingtip through the ground. So they flew it impossibly low. Um, as you heard about the Lancaster today, just a little bit more about it. The, the body itself came from a, a predecessor bomber that had a, a shorter wing and twin engines that just didn't work too well. And it was, it was failing. The pilots were afraid to go up in it. The crews were terrified. If one engine failed, it was going down. With the longer wing, the modifications they made in those four Merlin engines, this aircraft could fly on one engine. And it, it did so on several occasions. It had a reputation for bringing the crew back and it was just regarded as everybody uh, thought of as, as a great morale booster and incredibly effective. 
So they went into 207 squadron from training from uh, number 16 operational training unit for most of the families. They began to fly Lancasters. 207 squadron, as most squadrons did, had two flights. They called it A flight and B flight. And they also, because the Lancaster was so new, they undertook training of, of Lancaster aircrew in their own squadron with one or two spare aircraft. That was C flight. They call it conversion flight. So they were ported there. What's really unique about that is that when, when a modern air crew trains up in his or her aircraft, they go to a, a, an advanced training unit of some sort, they learn their trade, and then later on they'll go off to war. 207 Squadron Conversion Unit took these pilots into Germany on raids. They didn't have them together as a crew, but each one of, of our family members, while they're in conversion unit, flew missions into Germany. So they, um, they were experienced, and the RAF was trying to get them over a sort of a mythical hump. They felt there was a five mission hump and you were gonna die before that if something good didn't happen. So they tried to get you five missions under supervision, get you over that hump, put you together with your crew, and off you go. The statistics didn't really bear that out after the war, uh, but I take that as a, a great measure of compassion. Now here's another part about flying them like they're stolen. I'm gonna talk about the low altitude stuff. Modern low altitude training is based on time to fall. And the reason why they do that is uh, a, a pilot has to go through scanning a series of instruments in order to build a picture of where he or she is, situational awareness. And the, the common approach to this is situational awareness can break down for only as long as it takes for an object to fall to the ground. And so if you're flying at 1,000 feet above the ground, it would take I brought a baseball, that's for later. <laughs> but it would take 7.8 seconds for a rock to fall from that aircraft or a bomb. So the theory is a pilot can afford inattention for 7.8 seconds before rebuilding situational awareness and saying, I've got to do something with this airplane. Obviously there's more to it, but that's the rule of thumb and force. So you can see that flying at a thousand feet above the ground is, I won't say it's leisurely, but it's not a very workload intensive uh, matter. Now, if they step it down and they go to 500 feet, they're down to 5.6 seconds. That's a little bit more. And I can tell you, even at 200 miles per hour, flying at 500 feet above the ground can be demanding. Flying at 200 feet, you're down to 3.5 seconds. Think about scanning those instruments. Think about checking over your shoulder for, for Germans. Think about trying to navigate or talk to the other aircraft. You're starting to be very pressed for time. At 100 feet, you're down to 2.5 seconds. And at 50 feet, you have 1.7 seconds of inattention you can afford to have before you die. That's just breathtaking in terms of its demands. At, at 50 feet, you don't have time for anything tactical. You just stay out of the rocks as a pilot and you're utterly dependent on the people around you to do everything else for you. This crew flew at 50 feet on more than one occasion with a bomber whose wingspan was 100 feet. So, the other part of, of this in terms of the sheer bulk of the aircraft, I'm telling stories based on my experience. This is the last aircraft I flew tactically, the F-18 Hornet, a 37 foot wingspan. Uh, and, and when I flew low, when I flew at 200 feet or 100 feet, I did nothing but try to stay out of the ground. And there's the Lancaster. Picture keeping that thing out of the dirt. I had two flight control computers, autopilot, GPS, you name it. I had everything helping me. They had cables, right? Cables connected to the engine, gauges with tubes and gears, and a, a man next to, the, next to the pilot helping him to work these things and check the gas tanks that they had to switch manually. I can't fathom flying this aircraft at 50 feet, but they did, and they did it more than once. My final comparison, a little Canadian happy snap of one of their F-18s next to the Canadian Lancaster. Mm -hmm. Uh, they call that Lancaster Vera. If you, if you look at the, uh, the code letters on the side as a, as a kind of a compressed name, they decided that was appropriate. Okay, everybody hanging with me? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about some, some raids. So the first one I found to be really remarkable was Wismar on, on September 23rd. They were going to go after uh, the Dornier Aircraft Factory. We heard earlier today of one of the Spitfire pilots or Hurricane pilots who shot down a Dornier 17. They were made at this factory on the Baltic coast. Uh, 83 Lancasters from five group land, five failed to return. And this is a, a snap 
from the orders that are at uh, the UK archives. And to me, it's stunning. The targets to be attacked from below cloud level, from west to east, downwind, but you're not to go under 1,200 feet under any circumstances. Okay? Now let's think about this. In a blacked out country at war, when you're flying at night, you are dependent upon lunar and stellar illumination in order to see the Earth. If you're flying under an overcast, how much of that light makes it through? Mm -hmm. It's pitch black. I mean, you're flying through ink black. And they're saying, but not below 1,200 feet. I just could not get over that. A little bit more about it. They talk about picking your best crews. Now here's something that I can't tell you happened, but I can tell you I believe it happened. I believe this young crew was picked as one of the best. Normally, orders called for new crews to go out and lay mines and do kind of benign things. And within three weeks of joining the squadron's crews, these guys were doing a low level at one in the morning under an overcast. That's not nothing. So, oh, I have to tell you a little bit more before I go. So how did this go? <clears throat> there was an overcast uh, at about 800 feet on up. There was a thunderstorm. So to get into the target area, they had to navigate. They had to come down. They had to find the city. And then lightning was flashing. Their aircraft was hit by lightning. After it was hit by lightning, they went into the target area. The guns started to open up. And the city had searchlights, so they trained searchlights on them. Uh, the, the British air crews referred to being hit by searchlights as coning. What would happen is if, if one searchlight could find an aircraft, the others would kind of go on it and focus on it. And once that aircraft was lit up from all sides and the, uh, the gunners could kind of see the angle the searchlights were at, they would quickly estimate the altitude of that aircraft and every gun in the city would turn on that crew. So the crew in the searchlights was dead. They were not gonna make it. They were coned in searchlights at 800 feet at night in a thunderstorm after being hit by lightning. Anti-aircraft fire tore off their right wing tip and they kept going. They made three attempts to drop their bombs. In point of fact, they were so low, their bombs weren't gonna work. I don't know if they knew that, but remember those times of fall? Typically bomb fuses like that, you could imagine them being fused for about 10 seconds or what have you. So they need to be dropped from 1,000 feet, 2,000, 3,000. When you're dropping from 800 feet and below, you're probably gonna get duds, but if they work, you're in trouble. Because those fragments can go up 2,500 feet. And if you're 800 feet, they're gonna go right through your airplane on the way out. That's the kind of danger they embraced on their very first nighttime low level mission. So this is their report. As I mentioned, 10 tenths cloud up to approximately 800, target not identified, bomb load brought back, large pieces torn from leading edge by flak at 500 feet. Remember, don't go below what altitude? 1,200 feet? Yeah, 500. 15 minutes early, I can explain that some other time. Uh, encounter light flak and searchlights continued at 500 feet, three occasions, encountering flak each time. That's, that's not my picture of flying over Germany in the bomber stream at night and, and kind of just taking your licks. This is a very dynamic kind of flying. And it wasn't the only one. A secret raid was put on. It was planned in September. It was due for execution, and Bomber Harris wanted it done. He wanted a, a precision low-level raid done in daylight. Again, low-level. This time, the target was the Schneider Armament Factory in France, uh, the little town of Le Creusot, and it was near the Swiss border. They, uh, the RAF directed that some crews would be designated they would train, they would stop flying night ops, and they would specially outfit some Lancasters to fly in daytime by putting an extra turret in it. This is the occasion for one of the eight-man crews that uh, Windsor uh, found cause for joining the family. So they did train, they trained hard, uh, and it was a sophisticated raid. So anybody who's not a pilot in here is gonna look at this and say, hey, it looks like a geometry problem. But I can visualize this because I've flown plans like this. This is the ingress to a target area. That's the target at the right. Here at this X, which is 35, 45 miles prior to the target, the aircraft which are flying in this kind of a formation were to start a climb. 
with a flare signal, no radios involved. Each one of these is a different squadron. 207 squadron is back here on the right. They would fly in three plane formations, called a three plane VIC, and each one would go off the lead. So wherever you see one airplane, you should anticipate maybe seeing three. In all, over 90 aircraft were heading in in close formation across the French countryside. A flare went up, they started their climb. Another flare went up, they all broke up on courses 10 degrees apart from one another to create some deconfliction so that the ones on the, the most direct course would get there first and the ones on the most oblique course would get there last. So it created a kind of a timing decompression to take this tight little formation and spread it out some. All in all, they got 94 aircraft across the target in under seven minutes, which is stunning for a big bomber raid. They went across the target, they dove for the deck at sunset, and they made their way back to the English Channel and back home safely. Um, no aircraft were lost here. Now, there's a little bit about the architect of the raid. This is Guy Gibson, for whom this hotel is largely dedicated. That's the same photo of him right over there. Guy Gibson was kind of a almost adored uh, favorite son of the chief of Bomber Command, Arthur Harris. He'd flown for Harris <coughs> before, he completed a squadron tour, and was due to come back. And when he came back, Harris so badly wanted him to succeed, he called Five Group and said, I want him to have 207 squadron. And the, the group commander there said, can you tell me why? And he said, he has to have a good squadron, he's one of our guys, he's gonna make history, uh, so on and so forth. And he said, so I want you to do it. Of course, you're the group commander, so you always have your discretion, but you know what I want. So the group, uh, the group commander took his discretion and said, he needs to go to 106 squadron. It turns out the 207 squadron, although a good squadron, had leadership that wasn't working out for them and had some challenges. So 207 squadron got a man named Russell Jeffs as the commander. He was aggressive, he was beloved, he was steady. He was the right man for the job. At this point, Gibson was in his early 20s. And I, I believe, although there's no documentation of it, his maturity might have played into it. Also, there were some stories about him that came out from 106 Squadron, from the Dambuster Squadron. Um, a number of people referred to him as the Boy King because he always got his way. And he was known for bringing the cure. And he was also, strangely enough, a little bit of an elitist. Gibson came from a family of a social servant who'd been in England. He was sent to public school. His family life was unhappy. His parents didn't seem to get along very well. And to me, when you read it, it sounds like the basis for a person who's gonna overcompensate wherever he goes. And indeed, when he flew, he flew that airplane like it was stolen and he worked people hard. But he also seemed very class conscious. When he worked with, with uh, sergeants that he didn't know, he didn't even address them by name. He, he didn't wanna recognize them. He just called them ORs, other ranks. It's a designation that harkens back to World War I when the people who counted were named by name in reports and everybody else was called an OR. And Gibson was fond of calling people ORs. I would tend to think it was limited within his own crew with his flying sergeants. He developed some very close relationships, but he was not an easy guy to get along with by any stretch of the imagination. That figures into his death a couple years later. Another story. Uh, but Gibson goes on after 106 Squadron. He completes his tour. He's got to have some form of fatigue and yet Bomber Harris designates him to run Squadron X. And Squadron X has only a few weeks to get together, grab people, equip, and then attack the Ruhr Dams uh, and, and take them down in May, which he did. A spectacular raid, a very high loss rate, but Gibson was the man because of that aggressive style. Gibson had a hand in designing this raid. The low level daylight thing was a big Gibson stock in trade. So this is what it looked like. This is Le Crusoe. These photos were taken at the uh, town of Montrechard by one of the, I think, 94 <coughs> squadron aircraft. If you look at the diagram, you could tell which squadron did it. And so there's one of the aircraft going in low, right? Which looks pretty low, but he's not the flight lead. Wow. See that little dot down there? That's the flight lead. That's crazy. And so one of the aircraft in this formation has stepped over to the right side to be able to take a picture of two mm -hmm. for a little happy snap photo shoot, but otherwise probably would have been flying on the other side of that flight lead. Mm -hmm. How low were they going? Well, a lot of them crossed the North Sea at 50 feet. Um, here's a, a snip from the British papers the next Monday. Spectacular. Uh, it remained the subject of news reports throughout the rest of the war. Now, let's talk about birds. 
<laughs> a lot of you know that Bill Vandervoort was struck by a bird when they were flying in because they were flying so low. This photograph was taken at Naval Air Station Whiting Field where I went through flight training just a, a year or two before I went. A student pilot and his instructor were out flying. They struck a turkey buzzard. Uh, the student was knocked unconscious, slumped against the stick. The aircraft was going down. The instructor tried to rouse him and he couldn't. Popped open the rear canopy and jumped. Parachuted safely to the ground. The hole in that canopy combined with an open canopy in the back made a hundred and something mile an hour breeze through there that woke the student who wiped the blood and guts off his visor and realized he was alone. He successfully returned the aircraft to Pensacola, was awarded the Air Medal. Wow. He's not the focus of the story. The focus of the story is look at those guts. Look at that stuff. I mean, and that bird knocked that guy unconscious and he was wearing a flight helmet. So now imagine a Lancaster doing 200 miles an hour across the French countryside and a bird comes smashing through the front windscreen in the bombardier's compartment. Bill Vanderbord's knocked back. He doesn't know what's going on. According to a newspaper article, he said, I thought I was dead. <laughs> a pretty nifty feather. We were doing more than 200 miles an hour at the time. So let me put this in perspective. Americans, help me out here. How much does a Major League Baseball weigh? <laughs> Five ounces. Yeah. Okay? And a good Major League uh, fastball, somewhere in the vicinity of 90 miles per hour, right? Okay, so let's just round off and say they were doing 180. Double the speed. Mathematicians, kinetic energy, one half mass times velocity squared. So you double the speed, you quadruple the energy, and then you take the five ounces and make it into five pounds, and that's 16 times as much. In other words, that object came through that windscreen with 64 times the energy, energy excuse me, of a major league fastball. Does anybody want to be hit by a fastball, let alone 16 <laughs> times a fastball? That's what hit Bill Vandervoort. When he said he was stunned, he wasn't kidding. Mm -hmm. Now granted, that Perspex uh, canopy took some of the energy away from the bird, but it had plenty left. And when it was over, with 200 miles an hour of wind coming into his bomber, Bill Vandervoort laid on his chest and guided the bomber into the target. There's a line in the end of a James Michener novel called The Bridges at Toko Ri, uh, one of Michener's most beautiful anti-war novels. In the end of it, uh, a character who's an admiral reflects on the death of a, of a pilot he thought of as his son. And in the end, he says, where do we get such men? And that line came home to me when I learned about that. Now, if that looks like it's out of a Steven Spielberg movie like Indiana Jones, that's what thought hit me. Those are Arado float plane, they're scout plane fighters. They were around uh, the English Channel. They were kind of guarding the French coast against British shipping and there to take out British aircraft of opportunity. One or two zero seven squadrons aircraft had an engine problem. They struck a bird, it went into the radiator, it blew the radiator open, the engine overheated, they had to shut it down. That met their abort criteria, so they turned to go home. They were going home on three engines at 50 feet and they were attacked by three of these float planes. What's significant about it, besides the fact that they survived, was from 50 feet, they started a maneuver called a corkscrew. And a corkscrew is, is designed to take the very big wing of the Lancaster, and it's relatively low loading. If you take the wing's area and you divide it by the weight, you come out with a figure of wing loading. Less wing loading gives you tighter turning, better turn rate, better performance of all sorts. The Lancaster had an incredibly big wing. So in terms of defending against a fighter plane, it was not nearly as agile, but in whatever it did, it could do better than most fighters in terms of turn performance. So they corkscrewed from 50 feet, the fighters were coming down at them, they corkscrewed up, the fighters overshot, became prey for several of the gunners, they shot it down. They reversed, corkscrewed down, other fighters came in, overshot, and they shot them. They shot down two and they drove a third away with smoke coming from it and made it home. Remember the corkscrew. It was so, and remember, the corkscrew was done from an altitude, altitude excuse me, of 50 feet above sea level. Um, so I want to put their, their experience in context, uh, and I also want to put their loss in terms of uh, some numbers that people don't always get. So during this time, 207 Squadron's loss rate was about 4%, which sounds small, right? Every time you go out, 96% of the people make it back. Only four out of 100 die. But life in a bomber squadron wasn't built on one mission. It was built on 
every mission being a dice roll. And so if your chance of dying is 4% after 25 missions, you will be dead. That's a certainty. So knowing that they had a minimum of 30 missions to fly, you can see that we have kind of a, a problem here. They lost one Lancaster every time they launched 24 sorties. And they launched, on average, six to seven per day. Uh, in terms of flight hours, that was one Lancaster lost every 143 flight hours. A current mishap rate that's acceptable, in 1991, during Operation Desert Storm for US forces, was one loss in every 100,000, excuse me, 150,000 flight hours. One in 143 hours. That's 450 times the loss rate of a modern combat squadron. That's what our crews lived in and died in. I go on back, I'll kind of gloss over that because I hit some of it, but my point in the US is that the American crews have fallen through the cracks. The US has a very energetic POW MIA movement. Uh, the DOD POW MIA accounting agency, I won't ask you to say that back to me, has a $150 million annual budget for recovering remains to include forensic analysis, research, uh, exploration. And I would love to see our crew be the subject of some of that effort. But right now, they're wearing their own uniform. We've had some success. My new Congresswoman, Abigail Spanberger, listened to me during a campaign. Uh, she's turned one of her legislative assistants loose to work with me. They've identified the part of U.S. code that would need to be altered so that the three Americans can appear on the list of DOD's missing Americans. And that would open them up to receive part of that effort that $150 million can get. What that means is they can go explore for the wreck of C for Charlie. So this is where my normal brief ends. And I know this has left out a ton of things you want to know. So. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to uh, sip a little bit of this beer and I want you to fire questions. And I know one of them is, what the hell happened on November 25th? But I want to let people with the first questions go first. So with this, I'm going to take a deep breath and thank you for putting up with me and not falling asleep. <laughs> thank you.